Good morning. It's not spring yet, but I feel spring in the air. Let's uh, pray today for this service that our thoughts and our hearts turn to Jesus and we begin to thaw a little bit more, get a little more passionate and uh, enthusiastic about how good He is and meet Him. Uh, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank You for this day. We are Yours. Lord, there are many requests that we have on the prayer list. And Lord, we ask that You just turn our hearts, point out different people, burden our hearts so that we lift them up in prayer. And Lord, there are so many that are spiritually lost in our lives. I pray that you would help us share in your search, that you would help us be your partners in bringing folks back to your path. And Lord, bring us back to you as we wander. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. On the back of your bulletins, you'll see the prayer list. And the updates there, continue to remember Kathy Gallagher, a co-worker of Pat Pugh's. Uh, Her cancer is spreading and she has new treatment, so pray for her. Continue to remember the family of Margaret Henson. Her funeral uh, is here on Tuesday at 11 a.m. There'll be an interment at Jerusalem Baptist and then we'll come back here for a reception. Levi Keller is a two-year-old boy of some good friends of Tammy and and, uh, myself, and uh, he was in UVA all this week. He has a tumor, a growth behind his eye, and uh, they are trying to figure out what to do and how to treat that. So please pray for Levi and his family. Uh, Please pray for Robert King Jr., or Little little Robert, uh, Bo and Mitch's cousin, has a heart attack and cancer, pray for him. Sandy Rose continues to have foot issues, pray for her. Ann Sitzman is a friend of Ron and Joanne Brown, four fractured vertebrae, so pray for Ann. And Kathy Wetzler is a friend of Denise Cornell. She has uh, cancer and surgery. Also, Gilbert Kent. Gilbert Kent is Ryan's father. He has a severe infection in his ankle and uh, really needs your prayer uh, that the Lord would preserve his leg. And uh, let's go to him again in prayer. Lord, we lift up these names to you. We pray again for you to meet us where we are as we meet you. Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. We have heard the joyful sound.
Amen. You may be seated. The next song we're going to sing is Make Me a Channel of Blessing. We can't really bring God's blessing and Jesus to other people until we realize and experience that blessing ourselves. And this prayer from Psalm 18 leads us to remember just how God has saved us, how He is saving us. If you will read aloud in prayer the bold type. I love you, Lord. You are my strength. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. I call on the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and He saved me from my enemies. The ropes of death entangled me. Floods of destruction swept over me. But in my distress I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I prayed to my God for help. And he heard me from his sanctuary. My cry to him reached his ears. He reached down from heaven and rescued me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemies, from those who hated me and were too strong for me. He led me to a place of safety. He rescued me because he delights in me. To the pure you show yourself pure, but to the crooked you show yourself shrewd. Amen. Make me a channel of blessing. Let's stand as we sing.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful Lord's Day and for all the many blessings that you continue to bestow upon us each and every day. And Lord, we thank you for all the many blessings that you continue to bestow upon this church. And Lord, we thank you for this time of this service where we have an opportunity to give back a small portion of all that you've allowed us to have. And Lord, we ask that you take these tithes and offerings, multiply them and use them for the betterment of thy kingdom. These things we ask in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sarah. Okay, kids, come on up for the children's message. Ugh. Okay, y'all think you can figure out what's in the bag? I bet you can. Football? Soft football is the number one guess. Let's see if you're right. A soft football. A splat ball. That means you could get it wet and throw it. It gets water everywhere. That's even better, isn't it? I want to tell you about a little girl named Liza, and she loved to visit her grandparents' house because they had a big farm, and there were lots of woods around the farm, and they had a huge field behind their house, and she would play out there with, with Blackie, who is the name of their dog. And she would throw a ball as hard as she could, and Blackie would run and get the ball and, and bring it back. And she was playing with Blackie, and Blackie must have heard something in the woods, or maybe he smelled something. You know what he did? He just ran off into the woods. And she called him, Blackie, Blackie, 
and Blackie never came back. Now, her grandma had told her, you can play outside, Liza, all you want, but you don't go so far that you can't still see the house. But you know what Liza did? She thought, I'm just going to go in the woods a little bit and see if I can find Blackie. And she started going back a little into the woods, and she could still see the house across the field, through the trees. But she kept looking and looking for Blackie, and before you knew it, she couldn't see the house anymore. She couldn't see the field anymore. And she thought she knew where the house was, so she turned around and went back. But as far as she went, all she found was more woods. She couldn't find the, the field or the house, and she didn't hear Blackie. And, and so she... Well, she, she didn't have any with her. So she started calling out, Help! Grandma, Grandma, and all she heard was squirrels and birds, and the sun was starting to go down, and it started to get cold, and she started getting scared, and she started crying. About that time, she thought she heard, heard something, and she saw a light, and you know what it was? Her grandpa was out there with a flashlight, and he was calling, Liza, Liza, and Liza ran towards the light, and there was her grandpa, and and he, was, he didn't know whether to be mad or happy. And he said, Liza, we told you not to go out here in these woods past where you could see the house. I know, Grandpa, but Blackie ran out in the woods. He said, I'm just glad you're safe and brought her home and they had dinner together. Now, I tell you that story because every single one of us wanders away from God. And Jesus comes to find us. Jesus comes to save us, even when we can't find our way back to God. That's what happened when Jesus came to the cross. He came to die for us and to find us, just like Liza's grandpa found her. Let's pray to him now. Lord God, thank you for finding us in Jesus, even when we didn't know what to do. And we didn't know right from wrong. You found us. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.
Well, we've done it, folks. We have gone all the way, verse by verse, through the book of James. And we've arrived this morning to the last two verses of the book of James. So how will James end up? It's been a hard-hitting book. Uh, many of you uh, would greet me after worship and you'd say, Oh, Pastor, you were really hitting hard. And I was like, listen, I was getting hit hard by the book of James. He doesn't pull any punches. Uh, he doesn't hold back. He just tells it like it is. So how do you think he will end up this hard-hitting, challenging book? In verses 19 and 20 of chapter 5, let's see. My brothers, and the Greek implies sisters are in there too. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Father God, thank you for your word that every week continues to challenge me and guide me and help me. Lord, I pray that your word would speak to us today. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to move in action as we follow Jesus by what we hear today. In Christ we pray. Amen. I just, uh, let's see, three years ago finished a long stretch of time spanning a couple of decades in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains and in central Virginia. The lay of the land is very different than it is out here in the northern neck. Out here in the northern neck, well in fact when people visit me from central Virginia even now, the one thing they say about the lay of the land besides the fact that there's water every place is that it's just what? Flat! That's right! <laughs> Flat! You go to central Virginia there are just hills everywhere. What you consider Hills here are just rises in central Virginia. Lynchburg is a city of hills, steep hills. Even in the downtown area, it's very steep. And uh, the land doesn't follow the water so much as the elevation changes uh, of these hills and all the little streams that run between the hills. And when I first moved to the Lynchburg area, I thought I had understood the lay of the land in Lynchburg, but the highway system there is just a, it's like a bowl of spaghetti. I mean, it just goes every which way, and it was difficult for someone directionally challenged like me to find my way, but I had to get over to Main Street, and I was way off in the, si in the edges of downtown, but I knew which direction it was, so I thought, I'm going to take a little shortcut here. So I turned off the main street and launched off on my shortcut. And the more I tried to double back and find my way back towards main street and the river, the more confused I became to where I didn't know where I was. And I had wandered all off into neighborhoods that I had no business being in. You know, the kind where you have to lock your doors and roll up your windows uh, so you don't get carjacked or something. Not that Lynchburg is that rough of a town. But in any case, I started off with just a little detour and I thought I could find my way, but I just, I just started to wander further and further away as time went on until finally I made it back. But we all as Christians do this very naturally. We talk about the lost and we think of people who don't believe in Jesus or people who have never trusted in Jesus as their Savior. They're lost. You know that, that song, Amazing Grace, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Okay? But even after we begin to follow Jesus, come on now, look back over your life haven't you tried to find some shortcuts every now and then in living your life? 
and you've gotten off track more than once, where are you right now? Maybe you think, well, I know Jesus is just over that hill there, and I've, I've put a little distance, and I've gotten a little confused, but I'm hoping to double back to Him. We're, we're prone to wander. You know, the writer of the famous old hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, Robert Robinson put it this way, and, I, and this really speaks to me. He wrote these words that he was prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. In verse 19 of chapter 5 of James, I want you to notice some important words here. My brothers, family, he's talking to Christians as his family, his brothers and sisters. My brothers, he's talking to who? Unbelievers, who's he talking to? Other Christians. If anyone out there wanders from the truth, is that what he says? If anyone among you wanders from the truth. You see, a Christian who loves Jesus. We just saying, do you know my Savior? You know, do you know Jesus? Even when we know Jesus, we're prone to wander, Lord, I know it. One of the family dogs that my boys grew up with was named Captain, and he had a long hound dog lineage. Fantastic for hunting. Not so great for a family dog that you wanted to keep on the premises. Because if he weren't, if he wasn't tied up, or he wasn't in a fence, or he didn't have a shocker collar on, or something like that, he was prone to water to wander, Lord, I knew it. You could be outside, you could be playing with them, and if he smelled something that was interesting, if he heard something that was interesting, if he saw even a hint of a squirrel or a rabbit, he was gone. He was going. You can call him all you wanted to. And his sense of hearing shut off. It all, it, you know, all that, all that genetic breeding for a good hunting dog came into play where all he could think about and all he could concentrate on was what he was tracking, whatever that was. And he was gone. And sometimes it would be days before you found him again. In the same sense, I look at my own heart and I try to keep track with Jesus. I try to, to have my quiet times and to pray. I, I go to church. I preach every week. I teach Bible studies. And even with all that preacher stuff, I look at my life and it's a constant natural drift, unless I'm trying to do otherwise, Unless the Lord finds me, I'm prone to wander. And the first truth that James, the half-brother of, of the Lord, highlights here is to remember that we're a church of wanderers. Remember that because we often forget it or kid ourselves into thinking, we found Jesus, we've got this. When actually James writes to a, a good church, churches, I should say, should say, spread all around the world, and he says, if any among you wanders, because he knows they're prone to wander. Remember that we're a church of wanderers. I don't care if you're a preacher or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher or if you were baptized 60 years ago and have been following Jesus year in, year out as a veteran, never forget, always remember that we're a church of wanderers. It's just who we are as human beings with this very real thing still living in our lives called sin. We're stubborn and single-minded as any hunting dog or two-year-old. And we could be following Jesus, and when we pick up a track, a scent going in a different direction, we're gone. 
and we find ourselves calling out to Jesus, find me again, please. Remember that we're a church of wanderers. If we're going to do anything at Cobham Park Baptist Church to impact this community, if you as a Christian are going to reach anybody for the Lord, you must remember that you yourself are a wanderer at heart bound by Jesus. Don't forget it. Don't think you're in the clear. You know, when we're mindful of that, when we realize that we're wanderers found by Jesus, it really helps with humility. You know, Christians have a terrible name, terrible reputation for thinking that we're all that. Remember back years and years ago that old Saturday Night Live sketch, maybe some of you don't, called The Church Lady. You know, she would purse her lips and be very holier than thou. Well, isn't that special, you know? And uh, very hypocritical, just oozing from every pore, this, this plastic, holier than thou attitude. She'd forgotten if she ever knew that she herself is a wanderer who needs to be found by Jesus. And that's the impression many people at our workplace and our families have about Christians. But if we remember, as James knows very well, that we ourselves are a wanderer desperately needing grace, it kind of brings all of that down into focus. It helps us come down a few notches. You know, James himself had a very wandering history with his brother Jesus, who after all was literally his brother. And many times in the Gospels you read things like uh, his brothers and mother went to lay hold of Jesus because they thought he was out of his mind. Or even his mothers and brothers didn't believe in him. You know, there was a time where James thought he had all the answers on his own and he'd taken his own shortcut to God and he knew what God was all about and he knew his, his brother Jesus was crazy in his own mind. But that was until Jesus died on the cross. That was until he saw his brother who was dead, risen and alive again and he realized this isn't just my brother, this is the son of the living God. And now he's writing a letter that we call the book of James, humble down because he knows he himself was a wanderer who was found by Jesus. It also helps us have more compassion on others. You see a sign as you leave this parking lot. Anybody remember what it says? I hope you, I hope you do. You're now entering your mission field. So when we're done with worship today and we get in our cars and drive out of the parking lot, we're going out as a search and rescue team to try to pull other people back to Jesus. Sometimes that's in our own family. Sometimes that's within our church, as it, the case was here. Sometimes it's, it's where we work or, or where we go to Food Lion or whatever the case may be. And it's very easy to become a little cold and a little jaded, hardened towards those who just don't seem to know about Jesus and appreciate Him as much as we think we do. We spend a lot of time being very angry with those people, and you fill in the blanks with whoever those people happen to be. Yeah, you know, those people that Jesus came and died on the cross for. You know, those people who have wandered far away from Him, just like me. And when I remember that in that sense, I am just like them, I also desperately need to be found. It helps me have a renewed sense of compassion and a heart that is on fire to reach and find for Jesus those that He places 
in my life. And it definitely keeps me from getting bored and lazy with Jesus. Keith, that's a terrible thing to say, bored and lazy with Jesus. Well, you should see yourself some Sunday. You should see me sometimes when it's time to get ready for preparing a sermon. We often are so familiar with this amazing thing we call grace. We know Jesus so well that familiarity breeds contempt and we get bored with Him. And because of that, we take Him for granted. And because of that, we become apathetic and laissez-faire and lazy with the great commission of God to go out and search and rescue and shine for Jesus with those who are wandering. And I believe it often and usually starts at this point. We've forgotten that we ourselves are wanderers. We've forgotten just how much was on the line that we're talking about this eternal destiny called hell where we would be eternally separated from God in torment and Jesus found us at just the nick of time to drag us back from the flames when we were wandering in that direction. Don't have to wait for hell. Look at our very lives. How many, how many things has Jesus saved us from? How many dead ends and disastrous cliffs has he brought us back from because he went out to find us? And we forget all that when we look on our neighbor and say, isn't that terrible the way they are? And we forget that's us too. Remember that we're a church of wanderers. But here in James, it doesn't stop there. My brothers, in verse 19 of chapter 5, my brothers... If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, who's that someone? It's someone in the rank and file of the church. Not just the pastor, not just the apostle, not just the prophet or deacon or elder. If someone following Jesus sees someone getting off track and brings them back, verse 20, let him or her know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Second truth, be a church of searchers. Be a church of searchers with our eyes peeled for wandering, not to judge other people, not to feel superior to other people, not to highlight other people's problems so that we don't have to look at our own, but from a deep, profound humility that comes from knowing that we ourselves are prone to wander and Jesus has found us. And we're continually held in that grace and that awakens in our hearts a desire to desperately find others for Jesus and bring them back. I think of uh, all the cattle farmers I've known in my life. I haven't known that many shepherds of actual sheep, but I've known a lot of cattle farmers. And it seems as if we often think that cattle farming is you just have a lot of acreage and you build a fence and the cattle just eat and that's pretty much it. No, these poor, poor folks are out looking for their cattle all the time. They're always making a break in the fence and wandering off on someone else's property, sometimes miles away. They're always getting themselves in binds. I've, I've seen cattle farmers help a cow get their head that was stuck in the knot of a tree out. I've seen cattle farmers in the cold days of January when the cow pond is frozen over and a calf 
is drowning in the middle of the ice. I've seen a man put his life in his own hands and put an extension ladder out on the ice and crawl out there trying to bring a calf out just to save that calf. He goes and finds that calf or that cattle every time they wander because they, they know that thousands and thousands of dollars can be on the line. Jesus used a similar image in Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 12, where he talks about a shepherd that has hundred sheep, and even one can wander off, and he doesn't stay safe and sound by the campfire with the 99 that are fine. He'll go out in the hills and in the danger and in the uncertainty desperately looking to just find that one who'd wandered away. And that's the picture that we have that's more famous than anything else of Jesus the Good Shepherd and me. Jesus the Shepherd with me, with you. How many pictures of Jesus have you seen with the little shepherd's crook with the lamb in his hands? You ever seen that, a picture like that? That comes from this heart of searching that God has for us. And as we gather as His church, as His body, we ourselves join the calling to be searchers. Be a church of searchers. You know, take up this urgent initiative. If a farmer has cattle or a sheep that wanders off. They know that time is of the essence. Something could happen to that. They don't want to find a vulture-picked carcass out there. They want, to re they want to reach that animal before something worse happens. So there's a sense of, a of a emergency. They got to go find this person. This is the same sense of urgency that we as Christians should have to those who have wandered from Jesus. I've told you before about a time that I went outside in my backyard and I looked way over towards the dog lot where my oldest son, always outdoorsman, was out there working and he wanted to make a, a pen for some hound dogs and so he was, had his shovel and his post hole diggers and his pickaxe to go through roots and he was digging holes, and he seemed to be having trouble at one hole over by the garage, and he was, he was digging and digging and, and hitting and hitting, and then I heard it. I heard a metallic clang. Every time he was putting the shovel, clang, clang, and it occurred to me, oh my goodness, the power line must go underground from the pole and go right into the garage at that point, and that's what he's hitting on. And I was horrified and ran out there, and sure enough, that metal casing around the power line was all bent up and penetrated at one point, and he was a second or two away from getting electrocuted with his boots out there in the mud. You know, it was a sense of urgency that I had when I grabbed the shovel for his hand, from his hands and said, Son, stop, stop, because I knew I didn't have the luxury of waiting around. The same sense of urgency should be on my heart with someone that I know doesn't know Jesus. I should be praying in desperation for that person because I know that this is urgent and the stakes are are amazingly high, I would say astronomical, but the stakes of eternity are far greater than anything that can be measured in this universe. We're talking about the worth of an eternal soul that can either be forever in God's hands in love and in paradise with the Lord in heaven, or that can be eternally miserable and separated and in torment with their own ego in hell forever. Those are high stakes indeed. Be a church of searchers. In Matthew chapter 18, when Jesus tells the story of that shepherd out looking for that one lost sheep, 
says he finally finds him, and then he has a party. He celebrates. He, he relishes this moment. He is so happy. He celebrates that he has found the one that wandered. In the same sense, when we're a church of searchers, we should be celebrating grace. Look here in verse 20 of James 5. Let him know, this is if, let the searcher know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This isn't a dry theological comment. This is an enthusiastic celebration because the high stakes have rolled in the person's favor and they are saved. I've noticed that no matter what church I'm in, this sense of being a searcher church is the first thing to go in our drift away from Jesus. It's the first casualty on the way of wandering away from Jesus as a church. If you want to see a vibrant, powerful, used of God church, you will see a searcher church. And when I say searcher, I don't mean seeker friendly so much as I do a church whose hearts are loaded at, with compassion and urgency to reach others with Jesus and to be found by Jesus themselves. It's the first thing to go. We get so tied up in our pay packages and our events and the color of the carpet and uh, what we need to do next on the grounds and uh, the social that we're planning and the reception, all good things. But they pale in comparison to the urgency of our mission, our very purpose, and that is to seek and save that which is lost. We share the same mission of Jesus, not to judge the world, let's leave that to God, but to save that which is lost. That's our mission as Jesus. What, are we greater than our master? No, we don't decide to go against Jesus. We just kind of wander from him. Starts off with good intentions. You may have some, some events in the church or some ministries or some administrative details that are very important and we're spending a lot of time by them. Before we know it, we've taken a little detour. We've taken a little shortcut from the Great Commission. Before you know it, we've forgotten about what we're here for. And we become a social club. Or a family reunion. Or a business. A nonprofit. We're searchers. Remember that old John Wayne movie, The Searchers? Anybody remember that? Now, you're really showing your age now. Thank you, Andrew Packett. There's this one little girl that was taken by Native Americans and, and she was kidnapped and they, the whole movie is just them searching for her. That was their whole purpose. That was the plot. That's our whole purpose. That's our plot. Be a church of searchers. If that's not what we're doing, if that's not the top of our agenda, what are we here for? See that the searcher has caught up with you. See that the searcher has caught up with you. I can't remember the way the saying goes. I've seen it on bumper stickers and t-shirts. What, don't, don't drive so fast that your guardian angel can't keep up with you? Something like that. Don't live in such a way that you outrun the searcher, Jesus. See that the searcher has caught up with you. Here's where this message goes from preaching, not to meddling, but to my personal story. This is the story of my life. 
The story of my life is Keith Williams prone to wander. I was found by Jesus as a child. I first believed in Jesus as a seven-year-old and was baptized in his name, began to read a Bible, began to, to learn about Jesus all those years ago. And you'd think, open and shut case, I'm in the Lord's camp now. That's, all. That's not the story of my life. The story of my life is, being, is one continual event of being found by the Lord over and over and over again. Of wandering, coming back. Wandering, maybe not as far, but being brought back by Jesus. You've heard of the prodigal son. We may judge him because... He wandered off from the family and, and had to come to his senses and come back to his father. I mean, I'm, I'm notorious. I'm wandering off all, all the time. But this grace that I believe in, this Jesus that I follow, finishes what he starts in every human soul that he loves. You and me are included in that number and I stand here today not because I'm perfect or not because I've arrived, not because I've run the race, not because I'm holier than thou, but because I once was lost, maybe even yesterday. But I am found by him today. He has not given up on me. See that the searcher has caught up with you. It's so easy as a Christian to believe. You don't lose your salvation if you wander off. It relies on His faithfulness and not your own. But we're prone to wander, and some of you right now, if you're honest with yourselves, have put way too much distance between yourself and the searcher of your souls. Name, his name is Jesus. It's time to stop and be found by Him this morning. There are those of you who have never been baptized. There are those of you who have never found or been found by Jesus before. There are those of you who years and years ago were found by Him. And you know it's gotten to be so boring and familiar and irrelevant. You've forgotten You've forgotten just how far you can wander as a Christian. Jesus, find us. We stop right now. We turn back from our shortcuts of sin. We turn back from our doubts and our fears and our anger. And we call out, help. Jesus, find us. We know that you've been searching and waiting. Find us and help us to live once again in your grace. And as we do so, may we ourselves be searchers. Help us to join you in your work as a church. Help us to renew that purpose. In Christ we pray. Amen. I love to tell this story. Let's stand as we sing.
Father God, I just, I feel burdened in my heart for someone here today whose heart is broken over someone who is spiritually lost or wandering. They have prayed, they have reached out time and time again just to meet a slammed door. I just feel like that someone is carrying that burden. I don't know who it is or or who that person that their heart is broken for is. Lord, I, I proclaim that they share your heart. Give comfort and patience and wisdom and hope and perseverance as this person continues to lift up in prayer this one that has wandered. They continue to know when the time is right to speak and how to speak and when to just stop and work from an example rather than words. Lord, for all of us, we go from here with this blessing. We are prone to wander, but you have found us. Thank you, Jesus. We are yours. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Thank you, God. And all God's people said, Amen.